Okay, thank you very much for joining NTT's Tech Friday event. Um, special guests are Palo Alto Networks, and we're going to be talking about zero trust architecture and zero trust principles today. Speakers today, so myself, Andrew Stewart, I'm a cybersecurity consultant at NTT uh, Brisbane, Queensland. My role is helping organisations on their cybersecurity journey. Um, our special guest today is Ricardo Galbiati. He's a cyber advisor from Palo Alto Networks. Um, Ricardo's specialization is around zero trust architecture and principles, and that's exactly what we're going to be discussing today. So firstly, we're going to discuss, discuss what our zero trust is and what it's not from Ricardo's perspective. Um, I'm sure everyone on the call has their own perspective and opinion on what zero trust is and how important it is. Hopefully uh, today we can provide some more insights through Ricardo. Um, next, we're going to be talking about implementing zero trust with Palo Alto Networks and NTT. How you can do that. And lastly, we're going to be talking about a complimentary zero trust lifecycle review, which we can we can offer uh, uh, everyone. And essentially, this is a report which will show you how well your infrastructure is adhering to zero trust architecture and zero trust principles. OK, next. So better together, NTT and Palo Alto Networks. Um, let's just look at these two organizations at a high level. So NTT, arguably the largest world, largest uh, IT services company in the world. Um, we have a number of subsidiary brands, including uh, NTT Security, and that's where we deliver our managed security services. And that's all around helping organizations identify the really advanced threat threats in their environment. And we actually help not only identify, but uh, remediate, um, uh, you know, if an organization is hit with, you know, say a piece of ransomware, we can see that and help you identify and lock that down and uh, remediate that. How we deliver that is through our 10 security operations centers worldwide. Um, that's where our entire managed security services um, uh, is, is built within. Um, we have two, over 2,000 security specialists um, worldwide as well. Uh, over 100 million invested in cybersecurity research and development. So uh, all of that uh, investment and innovation goes back into our uh, cybersecurity uh, services. Um, uh, believe it or not, we uh, NTT's infrastructure is so large, we actually see about half of the world's internet traffic. So um, what that means is, you know, when there is, you know, this uh, malware and stuff floating around around the world, we can actually see where that's going to and coming from, and all that intelligence that we gather uh, through that network, uh, we're able to push back into our capability and our managed security services. Next, our cross technology architecture. So actually, to deliver our security services, underpinning that is actually um, some Palo Alto technology around, um, you know, identifying these indicators of compromise in people's environment and. Uh, uh, responding to that. Um, so next, Palo Alto Networks. So um, number one in enterprise security, 85% of the uh, Fortune 500, um, you know, 62,000 uh, customers in over 150 countries, ranked nine time Gartner Magic Quadrant leader. Um, for those of you that don't know, Palo Alto was actually the innovator of the next generation firewall. So around 2006, when they started shipping product, you know, before that, um, firewalls could only really see port numbers and IP addresses. And the thing is, it lacks context, right? So what Palo Alto did through the innovation, one of the core technologies they introduced was App ID, and uh, that's the ability to identify, you know, what applications are actually running through your network, and um, uh, regardless of what port or um, IP address it's living on. Um, so with that, and that forms a foundation for delivering uh, zero trust architecture. Additionally, there's a single pass um, innovation they made, which means they can look for threats within, you know, high bandwidth environments with low latency. So really great for you know campus university environments um, and additionally wildfire and that's the ability to identify known and unknown threats um, within the cloud next so secure by design so NTT and Palo Alto networks work together to deliver on uh, a few use cases so let's take one here firstly intelligent workplace for secure securing your employees so I think today in the age of COVID we've got employees working from home so what NTT can do is consult with organizations that are in this situation, as, as I'm sure a lot of us are, and we can help actually design um, solutions which are underpinned by Palo Alto Networks technology to ensure that your employees are secure no matter where they are. Um, additionally, which we're all familiar with, we've got intelligent infrastructure here, which is secure branch. So if you're an organization with a large office or offices around the world or a data center, um, NTT actually works with Palo Alto Networks to deliver solutions to 
protect that data and protect their employees. Um, now, the thing is this, the, you know, uh, Palo Alto Network solutions don't just, you know, it's not just set and forget or you just turn it on. This stuff um, takes design, architect and implementation services. And that's how NTT and um, that's where we add value, right? So we will assist taking you from a legacy environment. You know, if you're using, you know, traditional firewall infrastructure, we can help you design, uh, architect and implement it and migrate you to a next generation architecture. Um, so lastly, we've got secure operations. Now, uh, some organizations are attacked, um, you know, uh, are targeted, sorry. So what we can actually do there is through the managed security services I was talking about before, is build in um, really smart incident response and remediation services. And that's where NTT and Palo Alto Networks work together to do some really cool stuff, such as if you have a, you know, an employee in the environment that gets hit with ransomware, we'll be able to see that and actually, you know, remotely lock down an endpoint. Um, within the environment. And also we can even apply a policy to a Palo Alto file to stop um, that host communicating laterally on the network. So we'll lock that down. All of these great things across secure employee, secure branch and secure operations is underpinned by Palo Alto Networks technologies and NTT uh, professional services. And um, that's across uh, Palo Alto Networks, Strata, Prisma and Cortex products. Um, next, uh, I'm gonna introduce Ricardo, who's gonna uh, have a talk about uh, zero trust and how, how Palo Alto Networks can deliver that through their Strata platform. Excellent, thank you, Andy. And thank you for having me to this NTT Tech Friday session. I'm very excited and happy to be here talking about my favorite topic, which is zero trust. And rightfully so, as you mentioned, we're gonna discuss how that applies to the Strata elements of the Palo Alto Networks portfolio, which includes the next generation firewall um, in all uh, its formats, virtualized and containerized, and also, uh, for example, in our Prisma Access solution, which is uh, the remote working solution, uh, very useful into that secure employee scenario that you were just mentioning. Now, when we talk about zero trust, we cannot forget where it comes from, right? So where is uh, where has zero trust originated from? Uh, it's actually an interesting story because it came from discussions that happened during, during the Jericho Forum, which was a group of fellow CIOs and CSOs they used to meet in the early 2000s uh, and discuss specifically the topic of perimeters and how useful they would be in the cybersecurity and how they would be in the future, especially. They realized quite early, because if you think about that, even this slide uh, has been taken from one presentation that they did in 2009, was that with the mobile compute and uh, cheap devices being able uh, to be offered to employees and allowing them to work from any location, inside or outside the boundaries of the corporation, the effectiveness of perimeters was going to be uh, really reducing uh, over time. And uh, it didn't take long, actually, just the following year from that presentation for John Kindeva, uh, who is uh, claimed as the father of the Zero Trust, to release his famous paper called No More Chewy Centers. Uh, the Chewy Center is referring to the fact that if you have a hard shell in a Chewy Center, the hard shell being a perimeter, you are really uh, overlooking your security approach because perimeters are failing in cybersecurity. So that's where Zero Trust came from. But since then, and it's been almost 11 years now, there has been a lot of inter different interpretations uh, around what Zero Trust is and what Zero Trust is not, and mostly are related to it being used as a buzzword, as a term that can be leveraged to sell something or to pitch a certain type of technology. So what I like to do normally before we dive deep into how um, uh, Palo Alto Networks and some of its elements and components help with Zero Trust is do a, bit, a little bit of myth busting. Uh, first of all, there are vendors out there and uh, practitioners as well that would like you to believe that all you need to, for Zero Trust to be applied and implemented is identity or identity access management solutions. They go in so far as saying that identity is the new perimeter and that you should design your solutions just based on that. Now, identity is a core component of Zero Trust, is one of those elements that cannot be removed, but you can't design a zero trust solution just around identity because there is so much other implied trust that you need to remove and we're going to see how in a couple of slides. At the same time, there are products out there called ZTNA or Zero Trust Network Access. And these have the word zero trust in the naming of the category itself, which effectively, if you recall, they were used to be called software defined perimeters. And again, if it's a perimeter, most likely it has not, it doesn't gel well with zero trust. And these solutions are great to provide that kind of remote connectivity for users that are now working from home or remotely, but claiming that they offer an entire zero trust experience and capability is a little bit of an overstatement because there is so much implied trust still in, still in those type of solutions. And we're gonna see what I mean uh, soon. 
Micro segmentation, it's another great category of products that has evolved in the last 10 years probably, uh, and it's very effective in those dynamic uh, virtualized environments. But again, vendors out there that tell you, buy this micro segmentation solution that will give you zero trust are clearly trying to pitch a product and not the strategy that zero trust is trying to uh, uh, represent instead. At the end of the day, what I'm trying to tell you is that zero trust is not a product. It's not something that you can just buy and achieve uh, a zero trust simultaneously. You can not go and, and, and buy a solution off the shelf and with that automatically achieve zero trust. It's a strategy. So we need to align multiple products and multiple capabilities in a way that aligns against the framework. And we're gonna see that very, very soon. Let's focus still a little bit about the topic of perimeters and trust. As you can see, every time we deploy a device in the network, uh, that has two labels, one on the inside and normally one on the outside and they are labeled as trusted and untrusted. It goes by itself and by habit that we always point the untrusted interface towards the internet because that is where all we believe all the attackers and all the malicious operators live. While the trusted side leads to our own good network and good people that work within the safe harbor of our perimeter. But is it that simple? Like every now and then, by configuration or by error or oversight, some packets from the untrusted side need to cross through to the trusted side. And now if they get hold of a device that has trust or a user credential that is trusted within the organization, you see that there's not much stopping them because all that is within the perimeter that uh, Chewy Center that John Kinderberg, Kinderberg was referring to becomes very easily exploitable. You can ex explore the limits, the boundaries of this trust and use it for your own advantage. And that is also without considering the fact that there might be malicious insiders, people that are already within our boundary of trust, but they have developed their own agenda and they decided, for example, like Snowden and Manning, uh, to uh, test where the boundaries end, extract information for their own purposes, basically using trust simultaneously as a vulnerability and as an exploit. You don't need to develop any exploit if you have trust, right? Much, much easier as an approach. So the idea of zero trust is let's remove trust. Trust should not be, there should not be any more trusted zones and untrusted zones, and everything has to be completely considered as an untrusted uh, location and interactions need to be evaluated at that moment in time based on the vast majority of context that we can uh, require, uh, that we can gather at that particular moment in time. So that's like getting the uh, positive security enforcement model, hey, Ricardo. Yeah, correct. It's, it's all about getting all as much as information as you can and using that to enable access as opposed to trusting access. It's, there's a big difference between saying I am trusting this user and instead saying I am allowing this person to do this particular function at that point. Uh, good, very good point, Andy. And uh, one example that I bring uh, along most of the times is how do we deal uh, with the pandemic? Because people start telling me, wow, now we, we should be really paranoid. We should be non-trusting anyone. I don't trust Andy now because, uh, you know, he might be accessing my information. I, I should block all access from my colleagues. But that's probably a, a little bit of a, an extreme approach. But if we apply to what we are living uh, and breathing today with the current pandemic, if I was, for example, to access a very sensitive location like a hospital or a nursing home where the consequences of the virus spread could be catastrophic, right? Even though I can provide full history about my travel due to contact tracing and so show that I have not been traveling international, uh, that I don't have any symptoms. Someone before I access that, that location will still need to perform due diligence and for example, test my temperature on the spot. And in some cases, even require me to produce a negative COVID test. Not because I am malicious, I'm not trying to actively go and spread the virus on purpose, but simply because trust or trusting the information that I bring along should not be sufficient for me to cross uh, such an important uh, or access such an important resource. What so do you think about that, Andy? Yeah, that's a really good example of how zero trust has been implemented out, out there today, outside of uh, security technology, right? <laughs> yeah, and there are a few other examples like airport security that I always bring along, but um, we can talk about that in, in, a, in, a, in a separate conversation probably. Cool. When it comes to zero trust principles, we need all to realize that these have not changed. 10 years have passed and zero trust has been, you know, uh, had its ups and downs and misinterpretations, but at the core foundation of its values, there are these four principles that refer to the fact that zero trust needs to be applied where it makes the most sense, where priority and risk reduction has the biggest impact. 
So that why we say that we that's why we say we need to align it to mission outcomes. What are the assets of any business that you need to protect first? So start there, apply zero trust. All those control and context gathering has to happen around those uh, elements. And how do we do that? By designing security from the inside out. And this, Andy, I think it's one of the biggest mind shifts that we have been seeing through, um, you know, the understanding of zero trust because people are used to design at the perimeter. When you design as a network architect, normally you start at the perimeter and then you go towards the center. While zero trust tells you to do the exact opposite, start where it matters the most and then go outbound. Yeah, exactly. I remember uh, reading about the positive uh, security enforcement model, like traditionally we would allow everything and then look for the bad stuff. And that's really hard to do. Whereas if you can say, right, let's just allow the stuff we want on the network and then look for the bad stuff in there. That's another like way of applying zero trust, right? Very good point. Absolutely. It's the, the positive enforcement, as you said. Uh, at the end of the day, if you think about it, it's like firewalls have been designed always to deny traffic and selectively allow what should be allowed as opposed to the opposite, which is normally open the gates and then try to catch what's bad in it. Exactly. So, and you raise a good point. So how do we determine what should be allowed? That's where the third point of the principle comes into play. That's where the who and what needs access needs to be understood. We need to create those policies around identity. And here it comes, identity as a core component of zero trust and context, what needs to be accessed and why. And at the same time, we want to inspect and log all traffic because in order to have a full visibility and a thorough understanding of what is going on in my network, I need to record every single interaction, possibly in a single location so that we can inspect, first of all, what happens at any given time and also remediate as quick as possible if something goes wrong. That's great. Thanks, Ricardo. So going down a little bit the path of, uh, of the principles, one thing that gets quite confusing is where do I start with zero trust? Like my, my problem is people tell me that I should apply it everywhere. Where that's where it comes about to the definition of the protect surface. Protect surfaces are those assets that are the core component and elements that you want to secure with zero trust above all. And John Kinovac came out with another acronym, another AAS, <laughs> but it's not as a service in this case, it's a DAAS. And that, that stands for data, applications, assets, and services. And uh, what do I mean by that is we want to protect assets that are related to that sensitive, toxic, very regulated type of data that any business needs to protect above all. Think about the four P's, PCI, PHI, PII, and IP. If any business holds this type of information and they lose it, there is no way to recover that back. It's a compromise that is basically lost forever. So that is why Zero Trust marries very well in following the data, identify where this sensitive data is and start putting those control and apply Zero Trust there. What we can't forget though, is that applications do interact with this type of data. And in some cases, uh, they are core elements of the business itself. Think about an online banking application for a large FinTech service. If that becomes compromised, the whole business basically can't operate. So applications have also become an important uh, type of protect surface that we need to focus on. Then comes asset, and this is very relevant in the IoT and OT world, for example, in uh, utilities, critical infrastructure, healthcare, where we have devices that are effectively providing, you know, life, uh, life saving or life keeping and, uh, and social security for the entire country or, 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 a, or a hospital, for example. So those are also assets that need to be prioritized as protect services. And finally, services, which we can't forget because a lot of the plumbing that goes under the network in between, you know, how do we authenticate? How do we resolve domain like DNS? How do we uh, provide that kind of single sign-on access to our applications? If it gets compromised, can literally affect the entirety of the business down the line. So it's really about understanding your assets and what you're trying to protect and then building the zero trust model around that, hey, Ricardo. Yes, that is correct, Andy. It's a lot. It has a lot to do with prioritization and risk reduction before even starting the design of Zero Trust. And here is where it comes, right? Segmentation. Everyone tells me, wow, segment, uh, segmentation, micro segmentation, that's all it that matters in Zero Trust. Well, segmentation has been around for longer than Zero Trust, if you think about it. We used to segment networks for the pure purpose of efficiency, you know, uh, speed, uh, or even just organization but no one was really telling you why to segment for the purpose of security. You normally end up just chopping networks in multiple blocks 
and you're hoping that an attacker lands into one of these blocks and it's not very sensitive and maybe has a hard time getting to where he really wants to. While that's a very tactical approach, what we want is use segmentation in a strategic manner. And the way we do that is that we want to segment the protect surface. That is what Zero Trust tells you. Just segment, and, and this is also associating with the design from the inside out. If you create the smallest possible segment just around those assets that we just discussed, those protect surfaces, and make sure that no interaction towards those is possible without transiting the segmentation gateway, then we are implementing Zero Trust correctly. We are architecting it correctly. And guess what kind of enforcement do we need to do on that segmentation gateway, Andy? Put a firewall in there. Yeah, or what type of firewall though? It's all about the type of policy, right? So we want that to be up to up layer ID. seven. <laughs> yep. You said that before, app ID, layer seven inspection, that's what Palo Alto Networks is known for in the strata type of business, so the next generation firewall capability. That means that that segmentation gateway, in order to have that level of visibility, has to be a, seg a next generation firewall. It has to have a policy that respects and understands layer seven. But we have a problem sometimes because we don't have just one protect surface. We might have multiple of them across the business. Some of them might be related to data, some of them to applications. So how do we ensure consistency? Well, through centralized management, we need to be able to push consistent policies around the very segmentation gateways that we might be applying into different locations. And that's how we do that through Panorama uh, at Palo Alto Networks, our centralized management console. That's really helpful if you've got a fleet of firewalls, right? So you're not having to do that in policies multiple times throughout your architecture. That's true. It keeps it consistent. It's, it keeps even the objects and the policies consistent. So it's it's not about reinventing the wheel. If you have policies that you have applied successfully for a protect surface and you have another protect surface that comes up with the same requirements, why not just, you know, multiply and replicate that policy for that particular segmentation gateway? That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, great. So. And the next generation firewall comes in multiple formats because not every protect surface is physically existing in a data center. So we do have physical gateways still because they're not going to be gone for a long time. Although everyone claims that businesses will be run entirely in the cloud, we still have a lot of presence in physical data centers. But by its own nature with the evolution and virtualization uh, that we have seen and the digital transformation uh, push that is happening everywhere, we need to also be able to have virtualized next generation firewalls and even containerized next generation firewalls. And we do offer that as part of the portfolio at Palo Alto Networks because we want them to be scalable and uh, adaptable to any environment, especially when this environment is uh, virtualized, scaling up, scaling down, you know what I mean. That's great, thanks, Ricardo. But how do we remove trust, right? So I hinted at that a couple of times. It's all about context. We need to gather context from our interactions. We need to understand what is going on at any given time to avoid implying trust. And uh, this is what it means to apply a Kipling method of policy creation. And Roger Kipling is where the inspiration for the Kipling method came from. Famous writer and journalist, lived over a hundred years ago, he wrote obviously the famous Jungle Book. But on top of that, he also wrote a poem called The Elephant's Child, where he defined his uh, six honest serving men, he used to call them, which are effectively six questions. What, why, when, how, where, and who? And if you are able to answer these questions in any given situation, you, um, you know that you have enough context to understand what is really going on. So this is why it's important to apply the six honest serving men to our network traffic. And I'm gonna show you now, Andy, also how that uh, makes sense in uh, when applied through a next generation firewall. Okay, cool. So for example, here we have a user trying to access a certain location and in the history of network security and um, layer four firewall, standard firewall, let's say, the only information you had available in order to grant or deny this access was the source IP of that user, the destination IP of that resource, the port where uh, the protocol through which the transaction happens and the timestamp, so the moment at which this event happened. And for, I'd say, 30 years, we have been allowing or denying traffic based on this very, very context lacking information. We don't know what is really going on. What does this mean? What can we imply? What can we understand? Is this safe? Should we allow it? Should we deny it? Well, the majority of access lists are designed exactly like that. But instead, if we start elevating that conversation and we move up 
towards layer seven, as discussed before. And for example, we synchronize with the infrastructure and we can extract a tag for that server. And that server is a research and development server. And it contains confidential data because the tags tells us so. And the username behind that IP address is Ann Jacobson. And he happens to belong in our Active Directory infrastructure to product management. And now behind that port and protocol, we see a particular type of traffic, which is SSL. But SSL is a tunnel and we can't imply to just allow tunnels without inspecting them. So we want to look inside a tunnel and see that there is an HTTP protocol for an application that is slash here, performing an upload function. And these two come together with app ID from Palo Alto Networks. And finally, we know that the file transfer happening there is for a roadmap PDF file. Now we have context. Now we can answer those famous Kipling questions, the honest serving men, who is doing what, how, why, where, and when. So we can allow this access. We're not trusting this user. We're not trusting this connection. We are literally allowing it at that moment in time based on the context that we have gathered from the next generation firewall. The problem here is the context can quickly change. And as you can see, if, even if the bottom line is the same, the IP addresses could be exactly the same in the port and protocol as well. But in, in this case, we have an IT administrator with clearly too, many permis too much permission trying to access a finance server and extracting through web browsing a bunch of credit cards. This would be completely oblivious to an access list, but not to a layer seven next generation firewall and to a zero trust policy because we would be blocking this type of interaction. Yeah, because you get all that context, hey Ricardo, uh, there. And this is the other thing, like with the traditional approach, I think literally any application can use port 443. So how do you put a allow or deny and relate that to a user? Like how would you create a policy if you don't have that context, you know? Um, so that's really great. Very well said. Ports are exactly the, probably one of the biggest uh, elements of implied trust. You are trusting a port and you don't even know what runs on it because we have more application than ports. That's the problem. So we have to start recycling ports. And that's what happens when if I open a port, am I really opening the application? I think it's going to run on it. Probably not. And applications are evasive, right? So even if you set a policy for a unique port number, an application can just jump into another port to, uh, in your firewall that's open. So that's how smart applications are today, hey? So that's let's right. get that context with the Palo Alto solution. Absolutely. So guess what? This is how a next generation firewall policy looks like. And as you can see at the top, it aligns perfectly against the Kipling method of policy creation. We have the identity element, the answer to the question who, so that, that's user ID in, uh, in next generation firewall terminology. The what is the application. So what are we using to access that resource? The time when we can absolutely enforce policies around that. The where, the destination, where am I going with that particular access? The why is related to the classification and that can be a data loss uh, prevention or sensitivity discussion. And also the how, finally. So yes, I'm allowing you, I know what application you're using, I know who you are and, you, and the fact that you're allowed to interact with that resource, but I want to inspect how you're accessing. Are you accessing uh, using, you know, sending the correct type of content? Are you sharing the right type of files? Is, are the files that you're sending or retrieving malicious? And that is what the content ID element of Palo Alto Networks, including of threat prevention and wildfire uh, or even file-based exclusions is very relevant. And only when all these steps, these elements of the policy align, then we can allow that traffic to happen. No trust involved here, no implied trust, only allowed when all the context has been respected. So, given that we have talked about how the next generation firewall uh, helps in building zero trust, especially in networks and in virtualized environment, I think there is a great opportunity for us, and an entity and Palo Alto Networks, to go out together and offer something to our customers that might, you know, uh, opening their eyes about um, how close or how far they are towards their zero trust journey. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. So the thing is, you know, we see some customers today that are still in that uh, legacy approach where they're only setting policies, you know, on the port number and uh, IP addresses. Whereas when we are, uh, we introduce something like a zero trust lifecycle review, we can actually provide a really comprehensive report, which will show scenarios such as the one you had before. We had a sysadmin guy accessing a, a server with credit card details on there. And that's the level of visibility one of these uh, zero trust reports can give you. It'll show you uh, all the applications that are in use, who's using the application and, and also what they're doing with the application. So um, one of them reports provides, you know, it's a really rich 
report um, and provides a lot of context around what's actually happening in your environment. And you can measure how well you're, you know, uh, implementing the zero trust principles. Um, so, sorry, go yeah, and Yeah, I was just saying, and it's actually very easy. First of all, it's a, it's a free engagement. There is no, uh, you know, any paid uh, uh, compensation to, to perform this exercise. We're talking about literally deploying a next generation firewall in one of your networks, the one that you choose, probably the one that you would want to apply zero trust to, for example, and that can be a physical gateway. It could be a virtualized gateway if we are planning to perform zero trust, for example, in a VM farm, VM farm in the cloud, private or public, it doesn't matter. And even if you have containerized environment, as I mentioned before, we have a version of the next generation firewall that works in that environment. So once we have deployed that in a completely passive listening mode, so there is no uh, network change required for you to implement this, we can achieve all that visibility, identify any suspicious traffic that might be already in there. Remember the malicious insiders or the assume compromise principle of zero trust. Someone might be already in your network and you don't know. This will help you identify that. And uh, you can also test it with integrating user ID already with your own environment. You can actually uh, synchronize it so that you understand now not what IP has access a certain resource, but what user is doing that, as I showed in the Six Tonnes uh, survey man before. And ultimately, we can produce that report, as Andy referred to, uh, that will give you a full breakdown of all the applications and all the risks that are related to zero trust in your environment as it is today. Yeah, it's really insightful, uh, them reports. and. Um, yeah, uh, we'd love to offer one uh, to the audience today. And it's uh, like, like Ricardo said, it's a complimentary service. So yeah, um, thanks again, Ricardo. So uh, if a zero trust architecture uh, is of interest to you and you, you, you'd you like to see, you know, how your organisation today is complying with them zero trust principles, you know, we really encourage you to connect with NTT and Palo Alto Networks. Um, uh, we can provide one of these complimentary zero trust um, reports for you and and then following that we can help you with some key actions you can take around implementing and applying zero trust principles into your infrastructure today. Um, so yeah, lastly, thank you very much uh, uh, for today, Ricardo. It was really insightful um, what you showed about zero trust um, and it's really interesting how Palo Alto actually enables uh, the principles you were talking about. So, um, yeah, again, we really encourage you to engage with NTT and Palo Alto Networks. We, um, we want to work closely with you on your cybersecurity journey and hopefully implement some zero trust uh, architecture today. Thank you, Annie. It's been my pleasure. Cheers, Ricardo.